All right. Good evening. My name is Rich Bazzillo. I'm Niha's executive director, and we are excited to bring you this uh, interactive uh, virtual webinar. Um, we did this quite a bit during the pandemic. Um, Niha was hosting webinar Wednesdays every Wednesday during the pandemic, and we're so thankful that we are back in person, but we are committed to continuing to do events like this. There, there will be another webinar coming up in December, um, and tonight is a special one. So for those that may not be aware, we have partnered with the um, Boston University Master's Program in Genetic Counseling for the past six years. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that we get an amazing, dedicated intern every fall to help us out with an array of different projects who are in their final year of schooling and get to work and learn more about bleeding disorders, NEHA, et cetera. And we are very lucky to have Evelyn um, Fisher this year, who has helped us out over the past eight weeks, which flew by. Um, so tonight's webinar is all about genetic counseling and how does it apply to the bleeding disorder community. Uh, so before I introduce Evelyn, um, um, I just want to give a little bit of background about her and then she'll share a little bit more about herself. So Evelyn was raised in Philadelphia before moving to Denver. So you've been all over the place, Evelyn, um, to begin a career in social work. And as we know, in the bleeding disorder community, social workers are the glue of our centers. So we have a very sore spot for social workers. Um, uh, when an opportunity came across to return to the East Coast, um, she decided to go into the genetic counseling field. And that's where she is today, um, almost graduating uh, in a couple of months, right? Um, so with that said, Evelyn has done a, a wide array of things for NEHA in addition to helping us with our database management. As anyone knows, without a live and active database, um, you can't be a healthy organization, to contacting community members, to reviewing articles, transcribing our mental health videos, uh, helping us out with all of her BU uh, colleagues and students um, for our Unite Walk and many, 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 many other things as well. So with that said, Evelyn, I'm going to spotlight you and then I will put up your PowerPoint. All right. Thank you so much, Rich, for that introduction. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to the whole NEHA community. As Rich mentioned, I uh, used to work a lot in the nonprofit space, so it's meant a lot to me to be able to kind of get back to that realm and um, go after some of those, those things that I'm passionate about. Um, before I dive into uh, everything today. Oh, you can you can share for that. There we go. Um, I do want to start off with a little bit of a live poll, and this by that I just mean just a drop in the chat um, about what you know about genetic counseling. If you've met with a genetic counselor yourself, if you uh, have never met with a genetic counselor, don't know what that is, um, or somewhere in between, just so I can get a, a sense of where everyone is today. And I'll give everyone a few minutes to throw that in. We have some people who have met with a counselor. <laughs> we have someone who knows nothing about genetic counseling, which is great. <laughs> Thank you for coming. GCs help coordinate care for people with genetic conditions. Great. All right, and uh, just looking at the audience, I also know that um, there are some people from my program, so a little bit of knowledge from genetic counseling and a little bit uh, on the other end of the spectrum. So uh, looking at the next slide, just to talk a little bit about what we'll be discussing today. Um, first things first is genetics can be really confusing. So I'll go over some terms uh, that we need to know uh, that I'll be using a lot throughout the presentation. You know, I think a lot of times genetics can seem like a whole other language. So just making sure we're on the same page uh, there in terms of terms. I'll talk about what genetic counseling counselors do specifically. Uh, the genetics of bleeding disorders. Specifically today, we're looking at von Willebrand as well as hemophilia. 
And then I'll, I'll talk about uh, genetic counseling under the context of bleeding disorders. So if you have a bleeding disorder, when you might see a genetic counselor, what you can expect from that, um, that appointment. And then at the very end here, just to put it on your radar, I have a little think like a genetic counselor exercise where I will be asking you to participate. Um, but again, using the chat is fine for that. So don't feel like you need to unmute or start your video. So diving into those terms on the next slide, um, the first big one that you'll hear me use a lot tonight is chromosome. And chromosomes are just condensed forms of DNA. Um, typically, people have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and they come in pairs because you inherit one from each biological parent. So one from mom, one from dad, um, and then you have 23 pairs of those. And when I say inherit, I mean, again, uh, I'm referring to a biological parent passing a piece of their genetic information to a child. There are genetic conditions that aren't passed from parent to child, but often in the realm of genetics, we are thinking of inheritability. So on those, those chromosomes, those tightly wound DNA packs, we have genes, which is actually not a term on this slide, so I apologize for that, but um, genes are responsible for producing proteins in the body, and those proteins code for things like what your hair color is, if cilantro tastes like soap to you, or maybe how your blood clots. Um, so when we think of genes, coding, um, and all of that, you get a genotype. And a genotype is that specific genetic makeup. So your genotype is what you inherit from biological mom and dad. And we also have a phenotype. So a phenotype is an observable feature. So if your hair is brown, that is your phenotype. The genes that code for your hair being brown is the genotype. Um, looking at a pedigree, um, a pedigree is a visual representation of a family. So uh, a lot of times genetic counselors will use this to kind of track that inheritance pattern through a family. So looking at this pedigree over here to the right, you'll see that circles uh, will represent women, squares will represent men, and if there's a pregnancy, we'll see a diamond with a P in it. So looking at this little pedigree over here, uh, we see a couple, a man and a woman, who have one daughter. Uh, they are currently pregnant, and that square is shaded in to represent that that man is affected with a genetic condition. So an inherited medical difference that's caused by a variance in our DNA. And so thinking of some other big terms on the next slide that we will use today, um, there's a bunch of kinds of chromosomes that we can have. Like I said, we have 23. And so pairs one through 22 are called autosomes. And um, autosomes are, have lots of information, but that last pair, that 23rd pair are sex chromosomes. And our sex chromosomes have lots of genetic information, just like our autosomes, but they also code for someone's biological sex. And I just want to make a note here that a person's biological sex is their sex assigned at birth, and that may be different than their gender. And there are lots of variations that can be found around the sex chromosomes as well. So typically, people assigned female at birth have two X chromosomes, whereas people assigned male at birth have one X and one Y. Um, and there are, again, factors that can determine someone's sex outside of this, um, but that's a little bit more detail than we'll get in today. And for the sake of simplicity of teaching today's material, I'll be using an example where someone's sex chromosomes um, matches their gender. And in real life, again, there's a whole spectrum to consider around both sex and gender. Um, but if you are looking at this uh, image below, it's called a karyotype. And a karyotype is a picture of all of your chromosomes. So here we see chromosome one through 23. And that 23rd pair is XY, indicating that the karyotype for this person is a, a male, is a male. Um, all right, and thinking about inheritance, now that we've talked a little bit about what chromosomes look like on the next slide, we have uh, three main kinds of inheritance that I'll be talking about today. Um, there are some conditions where you only need one of those two pairs of your chromosomes, so one of the genes on your chromosomes to be affected for you to have a condition, and that's dominant inheritance. In recessive inheritance, this means that both pairs of the gene need to be affected to have the condition. So if let's say this is chromosome seven, 
both copies of your chromosome 7 will have to have that genetic variance in order you, for you to be considered to have the condition. And in a recessive condition, if you only have one copy of that variation, then you're going to be considered a carrier for the conditions. It means that you can pass the condition on because you, you have either the copy that is affected or you could pass on your copy of the chromosome that does not um, have that affected genetic condition. Um, often carriers are unaffected, but there are times where a carrier will show some symptoms of a condition, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, but before I get into all of that detail, I do want to talk about um, the kinds of results you might be able to find on a genetic test. So on the next slide, Rich is doing the slides for me. There we go. Um, there are three kinds of results that you can expect to find. So the first is a positive result, which means positive for a condition. There's a difference in your genotype that is believed to have caused your medical condition, um, such as hemophilia. A negative means that there is no known cause. Um, and I will say here that it means there's no found genetic cause. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a genetic cause. We're still learning so much about genetics so quickly that a negative means that for now, we don't think, believe that there's a genetic cause for your condition. This may change in the future and not to confuse that more, but the third kind of result you can get is called a variant of uncertain significance. So if you think about these first two results, the positive as a yes, we found a reason, the negative as a no, we did not find a reason. This variant of uncertain significance is a maybe result. And in that maybe result, it means that uh, we looked at your genes or a gene and we found something a little bit different than we expected to see. Uh, and this could just be typical genetic variants, something that makes me different from you, or it could be something that could be a genetic cause. Um, like I said, we're still learning a lot about genetics. So we continue to study these BUSs, this variant of uncertain significance, and we'll let you know, um, hopefully, <laughs> if the, it eventually falls into that negative or positive as we learn more about that gene. All right, so with a nice base of genetics laid down, let's talk about what a genetic counselor is. So what is genetic counseling? We keep tapping through this slide a little bit. Uh, genetic counseling is the process of evaluating and understanding a family's risk of an inherited medical condition. So with that being said, if we tap again, we can define a genetic counselor as the healthcare professional who helps, uh, who is not only knowledgeable about genetics, but also uh, knows a little bit about counseling. So oftentimes when we're in these situations, we're going to see a healthcare professional it can be a little bit Confusing, confusing, or you could be a little bit anxious, and the genetic counselor there is there to help you um, understand the genetics and also help you deal with whatever else that might mean in your life and how that genetic cause is going to affect um, going forward in terms of your medical treatment. So on the next slide, there we go. Um, there is, ooh, my slides just got a little messed up, sorry. <laughs> um, we can see, um, you know, that again, genetics can be complicated. Um, so genetic counselors, we will go through bullet point by bullet point. There are a few here. Uh, they'll take that family history, thank you. Um, they will also uh, help you understand what genetic tests are available to you. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of genetic tests. Um, typically, we're not looking at all of your genes when we're, we have a genetic condition in mind. We're looking for those genes that we know about. Um, but sometimes we do look at that whole picture. So you can talk to your genetic counselor about if it makes sense to look for a little bit of your genes or if it makes sense to look for all of them. Um, and they really are there to help make sure that the appropriate test is being ordered. They'll explain what the results of your genetic test means, and then they can help you understand what all of that means and how uh, you what's going to make the most sense for you in your decision making process as you kind of go through that medical journey. And they're there also to provide emotional support. Like I said, uh, we are really here to treat the person as a whole. So on the next slide. 
we are also advocates for patients. Um, and one more tap uh, in terms of where we can work. Mostly you will see a genetic counselor in a hospital or in a clinic. Um, however, the field of genetic counseling is expanding. So there are also roles in research and in industry. Sometimes you'll see a genetic counselor in a lab. Um, and again, that's really helping treat the patient as a whole. And if you do one more click for me, thank you, Rich. Um, we often work with other healthcare professionals. So in advocating for patients as they're navigating the medical field, we help you work with your doctors, your nurses, your specialists, your social workers, um, really anyone who's part of your care team. And uh, when we think of genetic counseling, often uh, people either think of prenatal or pediatric or cancer genetic counseling as really where those are the kind of the big three where genetic counseling started. But again, we're learning so much about genes that the field is becoming more specialized. We might see cardio, we might see metabolic disorders. And um, again, as we learn more, uh, you're getting people who are more and more specialized in specific conditions to help really be that knowledgeable person to help you navigate your specific condition. On the next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, genetic counseling and bleeding disorders. So um, today, like I said, specifically, I'll be focusing on hemophilia A and B, as well as von Willebrand, though there are lots of other bleeding disorders, as we know, um, and you might see a genetic counselor for any of those. Now, oftentimes, um, we, there's a known bleeding disorder within a family. So in those instances, oftentimes patients will see genetic counselors in either a prenatal or preconception setting. However, um, since bleeding disorders can present differently, sometimes they're mild, sometimes they're more severe, this means that oftentimes um, people with bleeding disorders might see a genetic counselor in a pediatric setting as well. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is one that I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, so bear with me through this one. But if we think about the DNA as the instruction manuals to our body, um, there are all of these chapters. And so we can think about chromosomes as the chapters to the instruction manual of us. And any chapter, as you know, is made up of sentences. Um, and those sentences are our genes. So when we think about variants in our genes, some can cause medical conditions, and sometimes it is just variation. Um, so if you think about just a spelling difference, like spelling color, C-O-L-O-R versus C-O-L-O-U-R, it's just a difference, but the meaning is the same. But when there are variants and they can change the meaning of the sentence, um, like the car was red to the car was hat or the car was red red, there's different kinds of variations where things just aren't quite right in that proofreading. Um, so let me just, sorry. Um, and there's lots of ways that we can test your DNA. Thank you. <laughs> um, and that can be through blood, saliva, or a buccal swab. And that's just a, um, a cheek swab. So thinking about the overview of the genetics of von Willebrand, I wanted to start with von Willebrand because it's actually the most common um, bleeding disorder. And the VWF gene is located on chromosome 12. So it's an autosomal condition. Um, and it actually can be inherited through either dominant or recessive inheritance. Um, most often we'll see point mutations uh, being the cause of the von Willebrand um, condition. However, there are three different kinds, which is illustrated on the next slide. Thank you. Um, and so von Willebrand, the, the most common kind of von Willebrand um, is, as we might suspect, dominant inheritance. Uh, however, it is the most mild form um, and there's, like I said, two other kinds where the most severe is actually recessive. So we're seeing it past um, not quite with that, that pattern by pattern through a generation. Um, there'll be a little bit more variation when we look at a family history there for that recessive condition. Type two is a little bit more of a wild card and can be either dominant or, or recessive. And what's really gonna determine um, that dominant versus recessive uh, inheritance pattern is the kind of the kind of spelling error in your gene on that von Willebrand gene. 
Um, so headed to the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the genetics of hemophilia. So I mentioned that von Willebrand was an autosomal um, condition. Hemophilia is actually a X-linked recessive condition. Um, I will note that hemophilia A and B present the same, so they're clinically undistinguishable. However, the reason that they occur, their etiology, are uh, different. So if you have hemophilia, um, what this means is that there's not enough clotting factor, factor in your blood, um, mean, which means that you continue to bleed. And oftentimes we'll see bleeding in joints, um, and that can cause a lot of pain. And again, both A and B uh, will present the same, so the genetic testing really helps us guide your treatment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, typically someone has either XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes, so XX being female, XY being male. And if you have two X chromosomes, you have a backup X chromosome. Um, and because this is a, a recessive condition, we tend to see males more affected with hemophilia because they don't have that extra X copy as the backup. Um, you, if you have two X chromosomes, you can be a carrier, as I mentioned earlier, um, where one of your X is affected and one might not be. And looking at the next slide, there we go. Um, so there's lots of ways that uh, hemophilia can be passed down. Um, over here, if we see an affected male with an unaffected female um, having kids, there is a 25 or a 50 percent chance that they will have carrier females. However, they'll have two unaffected males because that unaffected female is going to pass down her unaffected X. So if um, the male children are getting an unaffected X from mom. The dad can only pass down his Y, XY, if, if they're having male children. Um, however, if we flip that and we think about an unaffected male with a carrier female, the unaffected male can either pass down his X chromosome or his Y chromosome, and the carrier female can pass down either her affected X or her unaffected X. So if she passes down her affected X to, the, to a son, um, that means that the unaffected male will have passed his Y chromosome, will see that, uh, that son being affected. However, um, in conditions where we're looking at, um, or where if the, there are two females, ooh, excuse me, let me restart there. So we can have an affected male, an unaffected male, an affected female, or there's a um, there's a 25% chance that we have a carrier female for this couple. Right, looking at the next slide, click through. We'll talk a little bit about hemophilia A first. So hemophilia A, um, again, I will mention that hemophilia A and B are clinically indistinguishable. So getting that genetic testing, like I said, is very important. Um, in hemophilia A, it's caused by uh, an issue in the clotting factor 8, so it's a factor 8 deficiency, and um, the most severe form is caused by an inversion. So what an inversion is, is if you think about your genes that are supposed to be read A, B, C, D, E, F, things just get a little flipped around. So if you see on this third example here, it says A, E, D, B, F, so you see that part is just flipped. In hemophilia B, which if you click again for me, um, that is a, a condition that is affected by um, factor nine, which is a different clotting factor than factor eight. So it's not quite as common as hemophilia A. Um, and typically uh, you'll see a point mutation. So just one of those letters uh, is a misspelling, whereas in hemophilia A, you'll see that bigger shift, that inversion. All right, going to the next slide. Um, so why do some female carriers have symptoms? And you can click through a little bit more for me, Rich. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> um, so like I said, females have two X copies. So uh, one of when we have two Xs, one of those Xs is turned on and the other one can be turned off. Um, but sometimes some cells have more expression than others. So in about 10% of uh, female carriers, they will have some symptoms of hemophilia. 
Uh, and the schematic over here is just kind of showing a little how it can happen a little bit by chance, where sometimes those affected genes are just turned on a little bit more. Um, so those red ones are a little bit more apparent, whereas sometimes there's a, a more of a mix. So you might see a little less expression there. And looking at the next slide, um, yes, so sometimes uh, hemophilia is passed down from family member to family member, and sometimes, um, you know, there's just variation that occurs sporadically. So I mentioned that not all of those genetic conditions are inherited, and uh, that's because when all of your cells are coming together, the egg and the sperm are combining to make you, you, we're, we're, our cells are duplicating a lot. And there can be, when all of those cells are duplicating, it, there's more of a risk for an error to be made. And when that error is made and those cells are duplicating, the change in the gene is happening over and over. Um, so you'll see that, that gene shift. And then there's also the case of mosaicism. And for the sake of today's teaching material, I won't get too far into it because it can get a little bit complicated, but the best way I can simplify that is by saying um, that a parent who is ultimately unaffected with a condition, so a parent who does not have hemophilia, may have some cells that are affected, but not all. And so sometimes, again, that gene expression will see a little bit of a difference um, in terms of what cells are affected and what are not, and how those sometimes your affected cells can get passed down while your unaffected cells are not. So again, it's just that genetic variance there. All right, we talked a lot about genetics. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the treatment behind everything. And um, in terms of what treatment there is out there, uh, you know, I mentioned factor five, factor nine in terms of hemophilia, and these are blood clotting factors. So if you have a bleeding disorder like hemophilia um, you're, and you're missing a factor altogether, there are synthetic factors that can go through infusion, which means that you're, you're um, infusing directly into your blood to help your blood clot um, the way that is a, a little bit more typically seen. Um, for hemophilia A, there is um, non-factor replacement. And depending on the type of bleeding disorder you have, it will affect what, what kind of infusion we, we might recommend. Um, there are also um, treatment that don't involve needles. So sometimes there's nasal spray, sometimes there's oral medication. It really, again, depends on what kind of uh, clotting factor we're looking at. I will say that a lot of people who have bleeding disorders do not want to take NSAIDs. So those are common pain relievers. And the reason that you uh, would want to avoid those is because they affect your blood's ability to clot further. So if you already aren't making enough um, clotting factor and then you take a blood thinner, uh, it, it can, um, it's something that you want to avoid. Uh, all right. And looking at mental health and genetics, as I mentioned, um, genetic counselors are trained not only in genetics, but also with the counseling side. So we're really here to advocate for the patient. Um, and genetic counselors uh, might provide referrals to other specialties, uh, such as mental health professionals. Uh, it's, they'll be aware of clinical trials if, um, if those are appropriate if there are other specialists that we should get involved and also um, community supports such as NEHA because the importance of community is uh, just such a great thing um, as I've been able to see for the past few weeks working with NEHA. So um, I do wanna talk a little bit about some cases and these are um, some, some common cases that you might see walking through your clinic door. So this is my think like a genetic counselor part of the um, session. And we'll start off with a prenatal case. Um, and in the chat, if you can just drop your opinions about what are some of those aspects, those mental health aspects, taking care of the patient that you think would be important for working with this patient. So Angie is a 30-year-old pregnant woman who is coming into your clinic for a prenatal prenatal genetic uh, counseling session. She just had her 18 week ultrasound and found out that she's going to have a boy. 
Angie's younger brother, Sam, is affected with hemophilia A, and she's older than Sam by about five years. When she was younger, she remembers uh, Sam being brought to the hospital for various appointments uh, before he received his diagnosis. And so just thinking about Angie coming in currently pregnant, what are some things that we might want to think about on the counseling side um, to help Angie navigate her pregnancy and some questions that she might have? I'll give everyone a few minutes to drop their thoughts in the chat. Yeah, so we have that um, the, we can offer genetic testing um, for Angie's son and that her son uh, has a chance of having hemophilia. Um, anyone else have any thoughts about what we might want to talk to Angie about? Can they do a mouth swab? Um, in terms of their, yeah, so your genes are your genes. Um, so sometimes we'll take that buckle swab, which is the, the cheek swab. Sometimes we'll use a blood test, um, but we, we can definitely see if Angie might be a carrier herself. Any, any other thoughts that someone might have? Could do a newborn screen to find an early diagnosis. Um, so if the fetus is affected, um, then Angie might be pretty nervous, especially, you know, growing up, being a little bit older than Sam and remembering him going to all of those hospital visits. Yep. Any other thoughts? Determine if she's a carrier. Absolutely, because we would want to know whether or not she can pass this condition on to her son. All right, yeah, those are definitely some great thoughts. Um, so just offering, again, as many of you mentioned, what genetic testing might be appropriate for her to figure out if Angie herself is a carrier, um, doing a newborn screen. So we uh, there are tests that we can do um, uh, with some blood work from Angie where we do so, what's called cell-free DNA testing, which would be helpful. Um, and I uh, thank you to Margaret to uh, mention that Angie might be pretty nervous herself um, without knowing really for sure one way or the other what she might be looking at. So great thoughts on the prenatal case. Um, on the next slide, I have another case. There's only two more of these. So looking at the pediatric case. All right, Bianca and David have a two-year-old son, Marcus. They noticed that Marcus bruises differently and more easily, uh, especially when he was learning to walk. They have another son, Nick, who does not have these same symptoms. Um, and when they first discussed their concerns about Marcus's symptoms with their pediatrician, they felt dismissed and like they were being overly protective parents. Eventually they switched providers and it was recommended that Marcus be tested for a bleeding disorder. So they probably saw a hematologist and they're gonna go meet with you. So what do you think are some genetic counseling considerations for this case? And again, I'll give everyone a few minutes to talk in the chat. Do they have any bleeding disorders in their family? That would be a great question to go through and get a pedigree for. Um, we have someone sharing that this is very similar to their own experience of sharing their son's uh, bruising and that they didn't order blood tests right away. So uh, definitely considering the you know diagnostic odyssey that some people can go on where um, if someone's coming into you as a genetic counselor, they may have had a bad medical experience in the past. Um, so really working with your patient to gain their trust and help them feel heard. Any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, so definitely having um, 
David or Bianca uh, get tested for being a carrier or uh, seeing if we can rule out um, where that deep bleeding disorder might be coming from on either side. Um, and if they wanna pursue testing at all for Marcus, Uh, some frustration about being told not to worry, um, absolutely. Especially being told not to worry and then finding out down the road that testing would be would be helpful. That's absolutely frustrating, yeah. All right. Great thoughts, guys. And we'll go to the last case, which is a preconception consult. Gina is a 36 year old and she has two brothers, one sister and none of her siblings have any bleeding disorders but she was diagnosed with Von, uh, von Willebrand as a child. Um, when she was diagnosed, her parents met with a genetic counselor who explained that sometimes um, these disorders can happen sporadically and aren't inherited and Gina, Gina is coming into your clinic to discuss her desire to start a family and get pregnant herself. So what are some considerations you might have for this case um, with Gina having a sporadic Von Willebrand, no one else in her family has this testing, she's 36 and she wants to um, start her own family. Referral for her husband, yeah. So if she has a partner or the husband, um, figuring out carrier testing for both of them would be really helpful. Um, and if she's diagnosed with von Willebrand, I didn't say if it was the dominant or recessive type. So knowing um, knowing that would be really helpful information. How about any additional referrals that you would make for this case? And again, no right or wrong answers. I'm just looking for, for how everyone's thinking about these cases. And if you were in these shoes, what you think might be helpful. One more thought. No, I promise I'll stop picking on everyone. So a referral for a hematologist, just because um, just because her condition is de novo, uh, she can still pass it down to her children. Um, so meeting with the primary care would also be helpful. Um, all of these are really great thoughts. Um, some other things that I was thinking about while writing this up was, um, you know, the the patient's age. So after the age of 35, we start to see some other genetic conditions outside of bleeding disorders that are a little bit more frequent. Um, thinking about how Gina might feel being the only person in her family with this bleeding disorder, if she's had good support in that, or if she's been feeling very alone in that would be really important to figure out as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so if Gina would like to start a family naturally or if IVF might be the case for her, depending on what her genetic test results or any other factors might be, um, would also be really helpful. So thank you for bearing with me through these uh, three cases. And if we hit the, the next button twice more, oh, once, there we go. Um, then we also, uh, just to summarize, thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. So um, genetic counselors often meet with individuals or families who have bleeding disorders to help them better understand um, those bleeding disorders and what other referrals we might want to make. Um, they can help provide risk assessment for the individual or other family members, um, help navigate future pregnancies, information about testing options, uh, and again, we're really there to help support the family, not only around genetics, but around emotional needs as well. And if you have any um, thoughts or if you think that meeting with a genetic counselor might be helpful for you, there's also findageneticcounselor.com. And um, that is the end of my slideshow. So we can just turn it over if anyone has any thoughts or questions or anything they want to share.
Well, El Evelyn, like I say, on behalf of Miha, thank you so much for giving us a um, bird's eye view of what genetic counseling can offer the bleeding disorder community. And we saw some in the chat that this is real um, information that is very applicable to our community in terms of finding it um, and in terms of having it in their family. Um, it, let me ask you about spontaneous. So if it is in the family and uh, a, a, a parent start noticing bruising, there's different levels of severity. What advice would you take? Because sometimes medical providers may say, oh, it's nothing to worry about, right? It's like it's, and then it just leads into more open doors. And it's not to blame any medical provider by any means. It's just that not everyone is an expert in a bleeding disorder. It's so, it's so rare. What kind of steps would you take for the average person to kind of figure out if they start seeing symptoms of something and they kind of run into dead ends with with uh with with their PCP. Let's start at the very basic level. Yeah. So um, you know, as you mentioned, not everyone's an expert in in bleeding disorders. So when you're starting with the primary care, you're kind of getting someone who's good at that that big picture. And you know yourself, and if you're a parent watching um your child grow up, you know, even if it's your first kid, you you're really there. You're you're watching your child through everything, and your your doctor might not see some of these symptoms that you're seeing. So, a lot of what I've heard from the Niha community is really being your own advocate and and making sure that you're heard. So sometimes, again, not to blame any one particular doctor, but sometimes it does take a few tries because it takes a little bit to be heard. So, um, asking for those referrals if it's to genetic counseling, if it's to a hematologist, if you are seeing unusual bruising, to try and find that person who is a specialist that can really help you find a diagnosis or um, navigate the health system. Because a lot of what we see is, you know, uh, people who just are running into roadblock after roadblock, and that can be really frustrating. And it's enough to make you want to quit, except for the fact that this is your life. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes it takes a couple tries, um, but just having people keep going, I would say. Which is part of our mission to be a strong advocate um, and to, you know, certainly know your body best and your child's body's best as too. Um, but yeah, we can open up for questions. You can unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat and we can uh, fire them away at, at uh, Evelyn. Well, as questions are coming in, let me throw another one at you. What was your favorite thing that you did with Niha over the last eight weeks? Ah, well, that's, that's a, I did a lot of great things for Niha that I really enjoyed. Um, the Unite Walk was really great. It's, it's um, you know, I think a lot of times when you're working in the nonprofit space and you're kind of thinking big picture, um, Things like the Unite Walk are a great way to see the families that you're working for and watch the community that you're um, you're working with. So uh, the Unite Walk was great. I've also got the chance to watch a lot of patient stories um, in terms of that mental health side of things, which I enjoy so much. Um, and um, getting to to kind of hear the the one on one um, side of of the Niha community members. Fantastic. I know we've jammed a lot in uh, eight short weeks there. It goes by <laughs> fast. Um, but yeah, we'll see if um, anyone else has questions for Evelyn. Well, you're welcome, Kathleen. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, good shout out Kathleen to- Kathleen is our program director. And Kathleen, thank you for year after year partnering with um, organizations like NEHA and really bridging the gap to these incredible students who will go on and do amazing things within the chronic condition community. Um, we hope it's bleeding disorders, but regardless of where it is, um, they will all do amazing things um, as, as it continues to go on. And Nancy Messina, our board president, said thank you um, for your work and your walk at the help at the walk. Um, Melissa said, I love learning about genetics. Me too. It's so fascinating <laughs> when you start seeing um, all this stuff here. 
Um, let me let me just ask you another question because I'm just curious um, where this is a true story. I did genetic testing where you do the swab, right? Mm -hmm. And then it gets sent in. It did not pick up hemophilia and I have hemophilia. Is it because for men, you have to see what they test? If like, I, I guess walk someone through genetic testing. Um, if they're testing what seems like a lot, 500 say plus conditions, and you test positive for one, but it's not the one that you know of is like, would you have to request if you're a male to have X and Y, or does it really depend on the fine print? I mean, cause I didn't, I didn't know any of this. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> others, if you do genetic testing, you may not know to ask this stuff either. Yeah. I mean, so like I said, um, we're learning about genetics rapidly, um, in the, the grand scheme of science. So it could depend on when you had your test, um, it could have been that they were looking for a specific variant um, for that particular kind of hemophilia. So if they were looking for just one kind of variation and they didn't see it, they might have just not looked at the other part of that X chromosome. Um, you know, when I when I was talking about those result types that you can can get, I kind of mentioned that a negative means that there's no known cause. Um, so hopefully if that test were updated today, I'm not sure when you took your own test, Rich, but uh, we would we know a little bit more at where we could say, oh yes, we, we did actually find this. So a negative uh, test result doesn't necessarily, like I said, mean unfortunately that everything's in the clear. It means for the knowledge that we have now, there was no variation that was thought to be positive. Thank you. Of course. Does 23andMe or Ancestry offer for bleeding disorders? Um, I'm not sure specifically about 23andMe and Ancestry. I will say genetic counselors sometimes have some feelings about direct-to-consumer uh, testing. So a lot of times for 23andMe and Ancestry, what they're doing is they're looking at those common variations. So uh, you know, I mentioned that there, there's certain spelling errors. So they'll go through and they'll look for these, they kind of spot check um, specific portions of only some genes. Um, whereas if you're getting a gene sequence, they're reading through all of the letters on that gene. So if you're interested in getting tested for a bleeding so disorder, a lot of times we'll, we'll recommend a, a clinical test over something like 23 or me and Ancestry just because of the level of detail that we're able to go into um, with clinical testing versus directed consumer. That's a great question. Thank you. It is. Looks like the, that, yeah, another question. I that goes for bleeding disorders as well as other genetic yeah. conditions you might be curious about. And then the other follow-up question was, do genetic counselors specialize in one area? One area. Um, they can, and some do, and um, sometimes not. So, um, you know, I mentioned there's there are some people who focus on just prenatal, which means a lot of like carrier testing. Um, often in those cases, you're looking at um, both the male and female partner. Um, in cancer genetic counseling, if that's a specialty that you're interested in, you're really looking at uh, your one patient and talking about family history. Um, but there are people who uh, kind of do general genetic counseling. So some of those, those more rare disorders, um, although I will say a lot of times there's um, different disorders. Uh, oh, I just lost my thought there. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but it can get a little bit complicated. Um, and sometimes genetic counselors like that variation. So they might uh, specialize in a couple different areas. So um, yes and no to the specialization area question. And then um, do most insurance companies cover genetic testing? Excellent question. Um, yes, depending is, is the answer. Um, so depending on Family history, there are certain guidelines that um, someone might have to meet in order for genetic testing to be covered. Um, you know, genetic counselors uh, also know the insurance side of things because um, that can also be a really frustrating space for patients to navigate. So knowing what 
might help someone meet that criteria um, to have their insurance cover company uh, insurance company cover genetic testing. I will say a lot of uh, genetic testing labs do try their best to work with patients. So if insurance doesn't cover it, um, a lot of labs will try and offer a discounted rate self-pay um, because it's really important information that can help guide your, your medical history. So um, excellent question there. Great. Well, Evelyn, thank you so much for putting together this incredible presentation. Um, it will be recorded or was recorded and it will be going up on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to share that and we'll be able to continue to promote the genetic counseling field to the bleeding disorder community um, for years to come. Uh, so thank you for that. And you'll be seeing Evelyn in a upcoming newsletter as well. Um, there is uh, uh, something that she created and on social media all about genetic counseling. And this is what we hope that we can share with these interns that are students, uh, working professionals, as kind of a, a wide array of experiences within the advocacy nonprofit sector. So Evelyn, thank you again. Uh, we so appreciate you spending uh, time on this presentation and we wish you the best of luck. Um, and as we say, once you're part of this Wicked Strong family, you can't get away. So um, <laughs> uh, we are we are we are lucky to have you here. Um, before we end this evening, I just want to give you a couple of just quick updates about what we have coming up. So this weekend is our Fall Fest meeting. Uh, there's still time um, to register if you're interested. It's in um, uh, right outside our our uh, office in uh, Norwood, Mass. Um, it starts officially Friday night with a welcome reception. And then we go into the uh, documentary, The Color of Care screening to talk about health equity in our healthcare system. Then it officially starts Saturday morning. So we have a day and a half of incredible tracks planned, uh, a multitude of events as well. You can find that in our uh, on our website. I just put the link in the chat. Then our holiday party is coming up as well on December 4th in Kensington, New Hampshire, followed by a Blood Brotherhood event. And as I mentioned, we're working on another virtual presentation that will be in uh, December. We have almost all of our dates up for 2023. So take a look at the calendar, starting with our couples retreat in January, all the way through um, our family camp, which is the end of June. So um, we we hope to see you this weekend. If we can't, uh, we are gonna have a couple of sessions that you can um, log on virtually from home as well. So stay tuned on that, that, that you'll be able to participate there. But again, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you to all of the genetic counselors that have supported our organization over the years. And we look forward to um, keeping in touch and uh, having the next intern next fall. Um, but best of luck, Evelyn. Thank you so much thank for you. what you did for Neha. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks.